So last week, after church, I was sitting at home. I think I was maybe in the kitchen with Yulia talking, and from the other room, we heard it. I heard my oldest kind of melting down, having a fit, and he's like, I can't do it! After about a minute or two of listening to that, I I finally get up and I walk into the room and and I look over at him. Would you like some help? (laughs) And of course, after he calmed down, I helped him. We sat there. We we talked about it. He was working on a school project and and he couldn't get it right. And so we brainstormed. We came up with a plan. And finally, we finished it. And this is what it looked like. Now, I don't know if you've ever made an Arctic Tundra diorama, and I don't know if you know me that well, but I don't have an artistic or crafty bone in my body. But we brainstormed, and we did it. Even though at first Solomon was helpless to get it done, we got it done. He got a decent grade. We've moved on from the diorama. Thank goodness. (laughs) But here's the deal, right? When it comes to kids... If you have kids, if you've been around kids, if you have grandkids, if you teach kids, you know that oftentimes they get frustrated and they feel helpless. Whether it's a project like this, maybe it's a math issue, maybe it's something in social studies, but sometimes they're just helpless and you kind of know that's par for the course. But unfortunately, feelings of helplessness like Solomon had for a brief time before he got dad's help, it's not just kids. It's not just kids who struggle and at times feel helpless and powerless to change a situation or or to fix a problem in their lives. It happens to us as adults too. I think the last time, although I probably feel this every other day of my life, but, but, but the one that really keeps standing out at me was maybe about six weeks ago. And I was on a FaceTime with a, a dearly loved family member who was in a hospital bed dying. And, and they were removing the tubes and everything because the, the doctors could no longer help him and within the next 24 hours, he would be gone. And I saw my mother-in-law in the video. I saw my wife there. They're in another state. I'm here. And I felt so helpless to do anything to help them, to do anything to change it. And come on, y'all, right? I'm a pastor. I know what to say in situations like that. I've been in those situations dozens of times at the deathbed of a, of a loved one. And I kind of froze, and I felt Helpless. I'm guessing that if you're anything like a helpless, weak, 42-year-old preacher like myself, you've been in those situations. Moments where you felt helpless, you felt powerless to change whatever circumstance it was that you were going through. Maybe for you it was with your kids. Maybe it was a a struggle in school that that you just couldn't help them overcome. Maybe it was a a health issue that they struggle with. And as mom or dad, you would love to be able to take it away, wave the wand, boom, they're healthy. But you can't do that. And your heart hurts and you feel helpless with your own child. Maybe for some of you, it's, it's an issue at work. You've gone through all the scenarios, you've collaborated with coworkers, but you can't find a good solution to move forward, and you feel kind of powerless to change it. Maybe for some of you it's a financial issue. Maybe it's one that you caused by living beyond your means, or maybe it was medical bills or something else that are piling up, and you feel kind of helpless to pay off the bills and to get out of debt. Maybe some of you, it's health issues. You've gone to every doctor imaginable, but the pain's still there. It's not getting better. Maybe the doctor even looked at you and said, it's not going to get better. You're just going to have to deal with it. And you feel powerless and helpless. Maybe it's when you got the call and you found out that, that treatments are not working on mom or the cancer's come back. 
and there's nothing you can do about that, and you feel helpless. Maybe it's something you're caught up in doing. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's anxiety and worry. Maybe it's your critical, angry, bitter spirit that you know these aren't good for me and I don't want to do it and I don't want to feel this way and I don't want to hold the grudge, but oh, I just keep going back to that and you feel helpless to change the situation you're in. Whatever it is, friends, that, that has made you feel helpless or powerless, you're at the right place. Because today, Jesus wants to help you unpack that baggage called helpless and give you help and give you power. Not your own, but his. And the section of God's word that we want to look at today is a great section of God's word. I I love it, but every time I read it, I get a little concerned. At least one of the verses in Philippians chapter 4 always kind of raises red flags, and i got to stop for a minute, and here's why. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that we're going to read in just a second, is probably in the top 5, 10, I'm going to say top 5, Bible verses that a lot of people know, whether they come to church or read their Bible or not. It's a verse that people tweet, they post memes about it, they, they maybe wear it as jewelry, like on a wristband or something. They'll ink it on their bodies. Athletes will wear it. You know those eye black things that they wear? They'll, they'll put the reference right here. And so it's common. People know it. But my concern is we often misunderstand and misuse it. This is the verse. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Or maybe you heard it, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Great verse, but but here's always my worry when we talk about a verse like this. Because you know what a lot of people, and a lot of Christians, and maybe even many of us at times, we read a passage like this and you know what we think? I can do whatever I want as long as I put my mind to it and I, and I dig deep and I work really hard and I can do all things. I can win the game. I can be the superstar athlete. I can get the girl. I can land the promotion. I can get the job. I, I can get good health. All these things. I can do all things through God's strength, of course. But here's the problem with that approach. One, that's not what God's word is telling you. Two, what happens? What happens when you don't throw the winning touchdown and instead you threw the losing interception and you're not the goat, greatest of all time, you're the goat who lost the game? What happens when you don't get the promotion or the job tells you that you're no longer needed or or you get the 10th call back and said, sorry, but we went with somebody else? What happens when the health issues don't go away and they don't get better and mom's sick and she's not going to improve ever? Then what? What happens when the marriage is not salvaged, the relationship is not restored? But I thought we can do all things through him who gives us strength, right? One of the things that we always have to remember when reading God's word is context, 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 right? Because here's the temptation we all have, right? We'll cherry-pick Bible verses. You ever do that? I do it all the time. I know you do, right? we'll, we'll, We'll look for something that we want. We'll pull it out of context and see there, it proves my point. Even when maybe it doesn't. And this is a classic verse that we often misuse and misinterpret. So we have to talk about context. Do you know who wrote this letter? It's a letter to a church in Philippi. Paul, right? Good. little Bible history. His name is Paul. Paul was a pastor and missionary. Jesus called him specifically, said, Paul, you're going to stop what you're doing, and you're going to follow me, and you're going to tell others about Jesus. And that's what Paul does. But that's only a fraction of the story. 
All right, Paul, before he followed Jesus, he was a Pharisee. That means he was a, 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 a Bible scholar, he was a, a church leader, he was a cultural leader, and everybody looked up to him. He was a rising star in that ranks, right? People were inviting him for speaking engagements. He would have lived a, a posh life, two chariots in the driveway, because those guys lived a very comfortable life compared to most of society. Paul had it all. He had the looks. He had the smarts. He had the career advancement. And he was in line to be the next top guy. But he gave it all up. When on that day, Jesus said, follow me. But that's still... Only a little bit of the story. Do you know when Paul writes these words? Paul is sitting in a Roman jail. Paul is arrested. He's locked up. He's in a cage. And don't think of like Onslow County Jail. That's plush compared to what the Romans had for people. He's in this dungeon, locked up. And he has no idea what's going to happen. None. And that's after a bunch of other things went down in Paul's life. In other places in Paul's letters, he, he goes into some detail about what he endured. Paul was often beaten. People threw rocks at him. They would beat him. Sometimes it was the government that did it. And sometimes... It was people like us. Paul would get to a town. He would go to the local synagogue or church. He would tell them about Jesus. He'd say, repent and follow Christ. He loves you. He died for you. And some would believe. And you know what some would do? They'd meet him out back after the sermon and kick the snot out of him and leave him for dead outside the city wall. And that happened more than once. He was shipwrecked. Did you know that? Not once. Not twice, Paul says three times, and that's at least what we're just told in Scripture. I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine somebody saying, yeah, my line of work, I do a lot of traveling, I'm, I'm on trains and planes all the time, and, and I've been in three accidents. I'm not getting on a plane with you. <laughs> he lost family and friends. Right, remember that group of Pharisees in the crowd that he used to run with? Most of them said, you're, you're, you're crazy and you're dead to us. In fact, they actively fought against Paul once Paul left their ranks to go follow Jesus. He lost his material wealth and possessions. He often went from place to place and solely relied on the generosity of others. Or in the middle of his preaching and teaching, he had to make tents on the side to earn a living. Yet, in all of that, Paul could say this. I rejoice greatly, right? Think about what I just told you. And the words out of his mouth is, I'm rejoicing, I'm filled with joy. But you're in prison, Paul, doesn't matter. I'm rejoiced greatly in the Lord. Why? That at last you renewed your concern for me. Now think about that for just a moment, right? He's in jail, he, he gets beaten, and even some of your closest family, friends, your church family, no, no one came to see him at first. Abandoned, helpless, maybe he felt that way. But he's like, I'm rejoicing now, right? Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And this is key, right? He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, even in jail. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can't help just sit in awe at a guy who's been through all of that stuff and I can't even come close to the stuff that he went through and this is his response. I mean, when was the last time you went through some things and you said, I'm, I'm pumped, I'm good, man. I'm rejoicing, I'm happy, I'm full of joy. Do you hear what Paul is saying? 
He's oozing with joy. In fact, this whole book called Philippians is sometimes called a book of joy because it's just flowing off the pages from chapter one all the way to the end, not just here. And so again, do you you hear what Paul's saying? Paul's saying this. He's saying, I may be helpless. He doesn't deny his situation. I may have gone through some difficult things. I may be powerless to change my situation. I'm in chains for the gospel, and I can't just walk out of here. I have no power of my own, but guess what? I'm not helpless. I'm not helpless. I'm not powerless because of Jesus. So what did Paul know? What was the secret to his contentment and his joy? Well, Paul knew this. He knew that whatever he faced, he would get through it. He knew that that even in the darkest of circumstances, he had a God who loved him, who died for him, who saved him, who says, I'm going to work all of this for your good, and I'm going to give you the power and the strength to get through it, even if I never take you out of the bad situation. Right, well, you heard about that in our first reading today, right? Paul was going through something, a tormentor of Satan. That does not sound good. And, and, and that's above and beyond all the other stuff he tells us about. And he says, man, I was pleading. God, please take this away from me. This is horrible. This is hindering my ministry. This is, I'm battling this. It's not good. Please take it away from me. Please, Lord, please, please, please set me free from this. God, I'm really struggling here. Can can you please give me at least a little bit of relief and help remove this tormentor of Satan? And God's answer was no. It was no, I'm not going to remove it. I'm not going to take you out of it. But this is what I'm promising you. My grace, Paul, is sufficient. My love for you is sufficient. I love you. I died for you. I save you. And I'm going to be in the middle of this problem with you. And I'm going to carry you through it. And so Paul says, I'm good. Paul says, I can do all things, not because of me, but because of him. I can endure even the most difficult of circumstances Right? Imprisonment. And eventually, if you know your Bible history, eventually Paul is going to die. He's going to die by the hands of the Romans who would take his life because he preached Christ. But he says, I'm okay. I'm good because of him. So, that joy that Paul had is the same joy that Paul says you can have. Did you know that? Because there's a difference between happiness and joy, right? You know what I'm talking about? We might be filled with happiness when we get to spend a day off with our family or friends. We might be happy that we got the job or we we got the promotion. We might be happy when we get to sit on the back porch once the kids are gone and sip on a wine with our spouse and actually have a meaningful conversation. We might be filled with happiness because of those things, but joy, joy is so much better. Because joy is not contingent upon the circumstances you find yourself in, whether good or bad. You're probably not happy when you're sick. You're probably not happy when the relationship is struggling, but you can still have joy because it's not based on what you feel, what you do, what you think, whether it's good or bad that you're going through. It's found in Jesus alone. That's why Paul could rejoice even in a jail cell. That's why you can rejoice even in a jail cell too. Whatever it is that's causing you to feel helpless or powerless, sad or worried, you're not helpless. Oh, you might not be able to figure it out on your own, right? You might not have the power and strength to take away the problem. Paul couldn't, he said, God help me. God said, no, Paul couldn't remove it himself. You might not have all the answers, but you do have Christ. You do have a Savior who loves you, who died for you, who says he'll never leave you, even if everybody else does, even if you're in prison. So you can have peace. You can have joy because of Christ no matter what. Because here's the deal. I'm going to tell you something that you guys already know, but life is messy. 
Life is messy, it's brutal, it hurts, it's painful. We go through all kinds of things that, that shake us to the core, and we might, even, we might even cry out like Solomon did, I need help, I can't do it. And so you know what you need? You don't need another pep talk. You don't need a, a, another speech about working really hard and pulling yourself up by those proverbial bootstraps because you're going to figure it out on your own. You've already tried that and you know it doesn't work. What you need, what I need, we need a God who would actually come to us when we couldn't get to him. We need a God who loved us so much, who was not afraid to come to a world that was spinning out of control, dying because it's drowning on its own sin. We needed a Savior who was not scared to get messy and, and covered in the muck and the filth of our sins, our failures, and our hardships. That's what we needed most. And that's exactly what God did for you. Right? God sent his son to jump right into the mess of your lives to find you and rescue you. Jesus was born a helpless little baby in a manger, right? We talked about how kids can be helpless. I can't think of anything more helpless, any th person more helpless than a little infant. Relies on mom and dad for everything. Jesus says, I'll do that. I'll do that, dad. I, I know I'm the God who created everything, but, but I'll be a helpless little baby for them. And so he came. He came to help the helpless. He came to live under that law of God that you and I live under, that we have broken and trashed each and every day of our lives. He came and said, Dad, I'll do it perfectly, and I'll give them my perfect, perfect record. They can have it. 100% completed because I did it for them. Right? You have a God who knows what it's like to walk in your shoes. Because he didn't stay on his throne, he came here, and he put your shoes on. He was tempted in every way like you, but never gave in. He knows what it was like to cry and feel heartache and pain when his own family once said he was out of his mind, and Jesus, you've got to come home because you're going to embarrass us and yourself. You have a Savior who knows what it's like to have those closest to you stab you in the back and abandon you when you need them the most. Jesus knows what it's like to be betrayed to bury a loved one, to pray over a sick family member or friend. He's been there, done it. And he did it for you, but he didn't stop. He then went all the way to that cross of wood and he was willing to stare down death and go to hell itself so you would never have to. So you will never know what it's like, not even a millisecond of what hell is like because Jesus went there and defeated it for you. That's why you can have joy. No matter what, right? Do you get that? Jesus chose the nails so you would never have to get them. Jesus chose sin and death and hell so you would be set free. So that you can have the strength, his strength, to get through anything you're faced with anything so again I don't know what you're all going through some of you I do some of you don't I don't some of you know what I struggle with some of you don't but I can promise you two things as we close up today I want to promise you two things and I can promise you two things because it's not my promise it's his number one whatever it is that's causing you to feel helpless or powerless it will not last forever you have to know that it's hard to know it, it's hard to see it, it's hard to believe it in the middle of the storm, but it won't last forever because Jesus says it won't. He says, I'll give you the strength to get through it and someday I'm going to pull you out of this world and bring you home to be with me. It won't last forever. And promise number two, very closely related, you will get through it. You might not think so. You might think it's the end of the world. You might think everything's crashing down around you, but Jesus says, you're going to get through it because I'm going to bring you through it. Whatever you're faced with, I, I'm going to bring you through it. 
Whatever dark valley you walk through, I've already walked through it before you, and I've cleared away, and I'm going to carry you through it on my shoulders until I bring you home. You can have joy. Even in the most difficult of situations because of him who gives you strength. No, I'm praying for you today that 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 truth gives you peace and joy this week, but I'm also going to pray for one more thing. I'm going to pray that it prompts you to show it to somebody else. You know somebody who's struggling right now? Know somebody who's maybe feeling helpless or powerless and they're really going through a tough time? Reach out to them. doesn't matter who they are. doesn't matter if you know them or you don't know them that well. doesn't matter if maybe you had a fallout 10 years ago or not. Reach out to them as Jesus has reached out to you. Text them, call them. Better yet, go see them in person. In fact, I'm praying so hard for you to do that this week that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sweeten the pot. I bought two gift cards to Panera Bread here on my own dime, and I'm going to leave them right here. And after church, it's first come, first serve. I don't care who it is. In fact, if there's two here, when, every, when I lock up the doors today, I'm going to be disappointed. Come grab one if you want. First come, first serve. But here is the stipulation. You cannot use it for yourself. This is not free lunch on pastor. You have to use it this way. Use it to reach out to somebody else who needs help. Preferably take them out in person, but, but even if it's in a card and you throw that in there, Right? Reach out to them and let them know that it's going to be okay. Tell them that Jesus loves them and has not abandoned them. Tell them that they are not alone. Not only is he with them, but you're reaching out. You're with them. Whatever it is, you're going to listen to them and you're going to try to help them. Let them know that they are not helpless. They are not powerless. They have a God who loves them and saved them. Tell them that. Tell them that they, that we, that us are not helpless and we are not powerless. We are children of God and we can endure all things through him who died and rose for us. Amen.